Hi, my name is Michael Andrew, and I'm about to give you a free tutorial on the amazing Sony A6600. A few resources I want you to be aware of, and I'll put these links in the description below, is my Facebook group. Check it out. It's the Sony A6000 series cameras by Michael the Maven. If you're coming from another camera system, we've gone through a lot of trouble to create a table of contents, including the time code. So if you hit Control F or Command F, depending on the type of computer that you're using, type in the keyword that you're interested in and it should jump you to that table of contents and then you can click the time code and it will take you to that lesson. This video is really designed to be a video manual to be used as a reference that you can come back time and again and look up the topics that you're struggling with. Now, if you are a pure beginner, I have to give you a word of warning. This video will go over the controls of the camera it is not enough to go out and take great images. The reason I say this is because I too was a beginner, just like you, but I didn't have YouTube. I had to learn through trial and error, and it took me two years. So if you're brand new to your camera and you're feeling frustrated, absolutely, highly recommend you check out my Sony A6600 crash course. I will show you the basics of photography, show you how to use your camera in real world shooting situations, show you my philosophy of use, what I'm thinking. We cover flash, we cover video, sports, wildlife, portraits, pretty much everything you're going to want to know and it does it in a very fast, efficient manner. I will put that link in the description as well. In any event, we have a tremendous amount of information to cover. Let's get started. So real quick, let's talk about putting lenses onto our Sony a6600. You're going to notice we have this little notch here on the cap. And as we rotate that off, that should align to the white dot. The white dot is important because you will also find coordinated white dot on the lens. So when we put a lens onto the camera body, we want to line those white dots up. We're gonna rotate it until we hear it click. Anytime we take the lens off the camera body, we're going to push the lens release all the way in and rotate off. And you're going to be doing this as often as you change the lenses, obviously. Something I wanna point out real quick, there's a few things, is that underneath the cap of every lens, you should see the thread size in the case of the 50 millimeter 1.8, 49 millimeters. Why is that important? Because it tells you the diameter, tells you how big the threads are, which is going to be required if you're going to put any kind of filter on here, ND filter, polarizer, things of that nature. That's how you figure out how big your lens threads are. Another thing I wanna point out is that when, when you change your lenses, it is very helpful to point the camera body down. Try not to change your lenses in very windy conditions because what will happen is dust will get blown in. But we live in a, a microbe world. We're surrounded by small particles we don't see. And I guarantee you, if you change your lens often or you leave it uncovered, you're going to see sensor dust more often than if you did it quickly with the lens body or the opening pointed down. Sensor dust will appear as these little kind of gray dots on every picture. You'll see it when you stop your aperture down to like F22 and take a picture of the sky. You'll see these little gray dots everywhere. Sometimes they'll just fall off. Sometimes you have to go in there and actually clean it. And I'll demonstrate this on the crash course in terms of how I clean my sensors. But those are a couple tips when you are changing lenses. When we're talking about the battery in the memory card, we have this little door on the, underneath the grip. We're gonna open it up. Keep in mind that we have these pins here for the battery. So there's a diagram here on the door in case you ever forget the pins. You can see the shape of the battery here. They actually go up, so the pins are up here. Second thing I wanna point out real quick is that there are two kinds of memory cards. They look exactly the same on the front, almost exactly the same. But when we turn them around, you can see that this one has a second set of pins. This is a UHS-2 class memory card it is not supported by the A6600, which means we have to use a regular UHS-1 card. The UHS class two cards are going to be noted. It's very difficult to see. It's this little teeny Roman numeral right there, but it's also important that you don't try to use just a plain old memory card that you find laying around your house because we have 4K video and it needs a sustained writing speed, which is designated with this little U with a three in it. It's class U3 and you'll notice that this UHS class one memory card has it, it's right there. It says U3. This is a, a pretty good memory card. You pretty much want to get one of the fastest memory cards you can. There are some great resources. This is the one that I prefer to use in the A6600. You'll see this 170 megabyte per second. 
That is the read speed, the write speed slower, but suffice it to say the faster the memory card, the faster your buffer is going to clear. We'll talk about that in some other reviews coming. If you look at the diagram, we're gonna line this up so this little notch is going into the bottom right here. And most memory cards also have a protect feature, this little slider that you can prevent the card from being written to. But we're gonna take this and we're gonna slide it in until it clicks. To take the battery out, obviously we're going to push the blue lever over. That's how you remove it. To close the door, we're gonna push the switch up and we're good to go. If you don't have your camera, go ahead and pause the video, go grab it, and I want you to follow along as I point out how some of these features operate. I want to take you on an overview of the external buttons and controls of the camera. Obviously the power switch, very important. So we turn the camera on or off. The shutter button is the button you're going to be using more than anything else. The shutter button itself has two positions. There's a halfway depression and there's a full depression. Now I want you to push that down and feel the difference between the first, it's like a spongy resistance that is going to engage the camera's focusing systems. And then when we push it down all the way, it takes the picture. So it's pretty important to know where those two positions are by feel. I think after a few dozen shots, it's going to become second nature. On the top of the camera, we also have this black rotating wheel. This is the main dial. It's going to be used for changing so many of your different camera settings. Very important when changing exposure. I'll demonstrate this later. Then we have the mode dial. This determines how the camera behaves when we're shooting. We'll be covering that a little bit later in this lesson. We have a hot shoe cover. It's a little plastic cover that when we want to use a flash, we need to take it off. You're going to see the central pin there. That is going to fire the flash. We have a flash tutorial on the crash course where we talk about using a Godox flash and the basics of flash about 45, 50 minutes long. Obviously we have the EVF, the viewfinder. Something that I love about Sony cameras is that while we hold the camera, we can use our right ring finger to release the lens. And as we mentioned earlier, this is the lens release button. Push it every time we wanna take the lens off. Obviously it depends on the lens, but often you will see autofocus, manual focus switches, stabilization switches. It really just depends on the lens that you're using. In the case of the 51.8, there's no switches. So you're going to notice on the side of the camera that we have this little plastic cover that it wants us to push towards the back of the camera. There's a little notch here that it's gonna make you wanna put your fingernail in there and take it off, it's not how it works. Underneath, and there are some icons out here that will show you which ones are which. We have the headphone jack, the microphone port, which we're going to want an external microphone. We also have the HDMI and our USB port. On the back of the camera, obviously we have the EVF. And something that's very important to note is that right here, there's a little optical switch. When we raise the camera to our face and we get close, you'll notice that it'll turn the back monitor off. That's a battery saving feature. It basically turns the, the back monitor off and the EVF on. Next to the right of that, a little hard to see, it's kind of hiding underneath the eye cup, is the diopter adjustment. And this is useful if you wear corrective eyewear, contacts, glasses, it's going to allow us to adjust the focus as we're looking through the viewfinder. On the back of the camera, this guy right here, this rotating wheel, I like to refer to it as the secondary selector for an important reason that I'll point out a little bit later. But you'll notice that this has multiple ways we can interact with it. There's a rotating dial that rotates around. There's a directional pad, which we can push up, down, left or right. And there's also a central set button that we can push into the camera. Very important is the deep menu button. I call it the deep menu because there's over 100 items in there that we can change and adjust. We have the play button, which obviously is going to allow us to play back our images and review them. We have the garbage button, which is going to allow us to delete images. You're going to notice right here at the FN or the function button. This is going to allow us to access different menus. And you'll also notice the C3, and we have a C1 and a C2 up on the top. Those stand for custom buttons, and we can customize them in different ways. When we're talking about the C1 button on top, if we push that by default, it is our white balance. When we push the C2 button, these are by default our focusing modes. C3 button are our focusing clusters. We'll be talking about those in the focusing lesson. We also have this little switch here that's not on some of the lower end Sony cameras. So you'll notice that we can push it up and down. The way this works, this is also customizable. And depending on what we point it to, there's a secondary button here we can push. In this case, it's exposure lock. In the case of AFMF, it should allow us to jump back and forth between autofocus and manual focus, but there is a way to customize this as well. 
we'll be pointing that out. Right here where our thumb would rest, just on the outside of that is the video record button. Anytime we want to start and stop video recording, we would press it. And obviously, hopefully you know by now that we have a great rotating monitor that allows us to face the monitor forward as we're doing vlogs and things of that nature so we can see ourselves on the monitor. The A6600, I do recommend getting an offset cold shoe mount over towards the right. It feels more balanced. And what this will do is will allow us to put a microphone on the camera without blocking the monitor. Small Rig has a number of them. They're pretty affordable, 15, 20 bucks. They're made out of metal. I believe in just putting it on there, a dedicated holder, unless you're going to be doing a lot of strobe or flash work. If you're doing video work, it makes more sense, but it's very difficult to see the monitor when we have a microphone on there. So offset it to the right if you decide to go that route. So we'll get into the camera controls itself, but I wanna point out that we have all these white icons out here, just things like this magnifying glass, we have a smartphone with an arrow. But these guys in here are going to be very critical. You're going to notice next to the directional pad. To the right, we have the ISO. To the top, it says display. To the left, we have the drive modes. And pointing down, we have exposure compensation and also this little grid icon. What these icons mean is that when we push the directional pad in the direction of the icon, we get access to that menu item. When I push in the direction of ISO, wants me to change the settings if I hit it twice. I can select my ISO by scrolling up or down, by pushing on the directional pad. I can also rotate the wheel. You're gonna be using that one quite a bit. Auto ISO, we'll talk about that when we get into the exposure lesson. If we push it again, it is going to allow us to set the minimum and maximums for auto ISO. So if you wanna put a hard stop on how far the camera can change the ISO when we're in auto ISO, that's what that does. Anytime you tap the shutter button, should jump you out of these submenus to the left, we have our drive modes, and this is what the camera is going to do when we push the shutter button down all the way. Obviously, it's going to tell you, and you'll notice, it's hard to see, we get these little triangles in there. Those triangles mean there's menu options to the left and right. This first one, single shooting, means we push the shutter button down all the way. It takes one picture. Continuous shooting means that if we hold the shutter button down, it will continue to shoot, and we get different frames per second as we continue to go down. And continuous shooting high plus is the absolute maximum, 11 frames per second. And as we go down, we get fewer and fewer frames per second. And in some of my testing, I've found that high tends to get better accuracy with the burst in terms of the number of frames that are in focus. So very often I'm shooting in high. We have our high shooting, mid and low bursts. Off the top of my head, I think it's nine, six or four, three or four, something like that. Then we have our self timer, single 10 seconds. If we push to the right, we can get a single for five and a single for two. We continue to scroll down. We have our self timer continuous and we can see we have multiple images. So a 10 second timer with three images, five images, five second timer with three images, five images, then a two second timer with three images and five images. Continuous bracket basically means is that the camera is going to change the exposure settings between different shots. This first number here is the number of exposure values. That's how many stops it'll change and for how many images. So three exposure stops for three different images. And as I scroll to the right, you can see that it breaks it down into different amounts, different images, nine images at one stop values. Pretty handy if you do landscape shooting, high dynamic range shooting. Then we have single bracket, which means that we have to push a shutter button down every time we want the camera to take the shot. Same basic concept is that it tells us the number of exposure values and then the number of images it'll take. Then we can also bracket our white balance. It just has a high and low setting in terms of how aggressive the white balance change will be. And then we have our dynamic range optimizer, also just a high and low setting. So those are our drive modes. It's what the camera does after we push the shutter button down all the way. Something that's intimidating in the beginning is the huge amount of information that we see. And I'm going to point out what these icons mean. Something I want you to do to feel comfortable with your camera is to get used to toggling your display. So if we look at the, the wheel on the back, when you push up towards the display, you're going to notice that this information changes in terms of what is showing on the monitor. About four or five different screens. Let's get used to doing that. It's this way, if something happens and you wanna see it, 
This is how you change it. The three most important settings you should always be aware of are going to be found on the bottom of your monitor typically, most of the time. It's your shutter speed, your aperture, and your ISO. Your shutter speed determines how long the camera is exposing light to the sensor. These are designated in fractions, and if we rotate this command wheel on the back, you can see we can get faster shutter speeds or slower shutter speeds. The F number is the stop number. It refers to how wide the opening is, whether it's a very wide opening or a very, very, very small opening. Your shutter speed and your aperture determine how much light are coming into the camera. On the far right, we have our ISO control, which is really an artificial boost. It's like a gain we're adding to the signal. We'll be talking more about these three in the exposure lesson. So we're in the manual mode. I'm gonna flip over to aperture priority mode. And you're going to see this little plus minus box with a plus minus zero zero. That is our exposure compensation. We'll be talking about that in the exposure lesson as well. So as we continue to push up on our display mode, you can see we get a histogram, which is essentially telling us how well exposed the image is going to be. We get a preview on our back monitor. We can see, get an idea before we take that picture. If we continue to push up, we have our digital level. You'll notice that it's green in the center, which means it's correct. Maybe not perfectly centered. There it is. So now we know that it's level from side to side. And if we were to tilt the camera up or down, we can see the orange tick marks coming off of there, designating our tilt. If we continue to press up, so now we come into the black screen menu. We're going to come back to this in just a second. If we continue to press up, this is where I like to shoot most of the time. So let's talk about each of these icons real quick. In the top left hand corner, we have our mode indicator. It's going to be P, A, S, or M most of the time. This is telling us what the camera is going to do, how it's going to help us. This little box here indicates our drive mode, which is what the camera does after we push a shutter button down all the way. AF stands for auto focus, in this case, autofocus automatic. The focus mode indicator is going to tell us how the autofocus works. This little box is our cluster. It's the focusing boxes that we have selected to help us when we are shooting. This little guy here with the brackets around the head is face detection. So AF on is face detection autofocus on. PP stands for picture profiles. This is going to be very useful for video shooters who want to tweak the look of their video. Up here we have a little card. 3,328 is the number of shots remaining that I have with the quality of images that I have selected. Three colon two is the aspect ratio which is three measures wide by two measures tall. 24M is the number of megapixels the camera is taking. You're going to notice that we have this flashing hand. Sometimes that will happen and some people will be like, what's going on there? If we make it go away. You'll notice that that is a warning indicator when we get into slower shutter speeds. It's saying this may not be steady enough and then it stops flashing. So when it's flashing, you see that little exclamation point and saying your shutter speed is probably too slow. Fine refers to the amount of compression that we have for our JPEG images. N is the NFC, near field communication, means we can connect with different wireless devices. 83% is our battery indicator. This square box here is our metering modes. This has to do with how the camera is measuring light as it enters the lens. We have our white balance setting. In this case, it says 5500K, which is Kelvin. We'll talk about white balance a little bit later. DRO stands for Dynamic Range Optimizer. This has to do with some of the contrast details that you're going to see in JPEGs. It'll make it a little bit more contrasty. This icon here refers to our creative styles, which is basically instructions for the camera in terms of how it is creating JPEGs. JPEGs retain only a fraction of the original information. A lot of information is thrown away. The creative styles are instructions in terms of what to keep, what to throw away. It has a lot to do with color science and how the image looks for now. Leave it on standard. And this little guy here on the bottom are picture effects. They're kind of gimmicky. They're in-camera processing that changes the tone and the look. I never use it. A lot of information here on this screen. If we were to continue to push up, we're going to go back to that black menu screen. So you're going to recognize a lot of these same icons on the back. It just gives us a little bit wider range in terms of our exposure compensation. We have our level, we have our histogram, we have our shooting mode, shutter speed, aperture. A lot of these are the same. Now there is one important difference is that in this screen, when we push the FN button, we get an orange highlight, which allows us to change many of these icons 
from this quick menu in the back. If you wanted to change, for example, your silent shooting mode, there it is. And some of these are only accessible here until we customize it. So if you don't want to do a lot of customizations, you can come in here and change things like our creative styles or picture effects if you really wanted to. The truth of the matter is that most of the important settings that you're going to change will be changed through either the C1 through C3 buttons or this back control wheel here in the back. But this is just an overview if you want it. If we continue to push up on our directional pad, we come back to this screen. Now, there is another way to get to those shortcuts, and that's by pressing the FN button. We don't get that black screen, but we get the ability to change many of those settings from a quick menu on the bottom. So we have our drive modes, focusing modes, focus area, which are the clusters, exposure compensation, we have our ISO, we have our metering mode, our flash mode. You'll notice that we don't have a pop-up flash on the A6600. Flash exposure compensation, white balance, our creative styles, the format, and we also have the mode that we're shooting in. When we get into the menu section, I'll show you how we can customize which of these menu options appear. Something else that's important for me to note is that when we flip over to video, so in our video mode, some of this information has changed. And I think I'm gonna cover up the monitor, so I'm gonna cover up the lens so we can see these things a little bit easier. You'll notice instead of having the number of shots remaining, we have hours and minutes. We have the format of our video the number of frames per second. We have our bit rate, which is the amount of data being written to our memory card per second. You're going to notice these green audio levels, very useful when you're recording video to make sure that you don't clip out. Pretty much everything beyond that is similar to what we see in a stills mode, which I'm gonna flip back to. In any event, that is a quick overview of the information screens and how we can access some of the basic settings from those screens. Let's talk about exposure. Exposure is a fancy word for really meaning brightness. So when we're talking about exposure, we're talking about how bright the image is going to be. Something that's going to be critical as you are shooting is to become aware of which mode you are in, the shooting mode. And I tell all my students to try to start off to learn aperture priority first. We'll be talking about that in just a second. Let's go through the mode dial and let me tell you what some of the differences are between these different settings. So we're going to be talking about P, A, S, and M. We're going to be talking about these in depth in just a second. We also have these numbers on our dial, one and two. Those are customizable modes where we can set up the camera exactly the way we like it and tell the camera to remember those settings We'll do that in the deep menu. Then we come to our video shooting mode, this little icon up there. S and Q stands for slow and quick. This is a video shooting mode that allows us to change how fast our video will play back, whether it's slow motion or fast motion. We'll be talking about that as well. We have our scene modes. The scene modes are kind of useful in certain situations. Most of this can be done if you understand your camera settings, you can dial these in, but for beginners, the scene modes is, let's say you wanna take a portrait, you can turn it to the face icon if we wanted to change it, see if we can come to it. We have our scene selection down here in the bottom right. And the idea of this is that the camera is going to be set up just to make it easier to get started. So let's just go through these real quick. We have our portrait, which is for people, sports, which is for fast moving action. We have our macro shooting, which is for close-ups. We have landscape, which is for scenes from far away. We have sunsets, which may have really bright backgrounds. We have our night scene shooting, handheld twilight for slow shutter speeds. We're doing longer exposures without using a tripod. We have our night portraits, which is going to incorporate some flash. And then we have anti-motion blur. So the truth of the matter is with these modes, I never use them, and I don't recommend beginners use them because they can do all of these things if they understand their camera, they can dial these settings in, but it's nice when you're first getting started. Then we have the green mode, which I also lovingly refer to as the dummy mode. The dummy mode basically turns our camera into a point and shoot. It's going to do most of the camera settings for us. We don't have a whole lot of control, and we're just gonna take pictures, and I definitely recommend not shooting on the dummy mode as quickly as possible so we can learn how to take full advantage of, it's an incredible piece of machinery, it's a great camera. 
And so what I recommend is for the most part, even when you're first getting started, if you're intimidated shooting the program mode because you're going to get some control over the camera, but if you are a pure beginner who really, really wants to learn their camera, what I recommend is starting off in aperture priority A. Now it's time to talk about exposure control. If you do not have your camera, this is where you definitely need to have it in hand because it's going to make a huge difference in your shooting experience and you're going to enjoy photography a lot more. Exposure means brightness. So let's talk about how we change our image brightness. There is a short answer to this and there's a longer answer to this and I'm going to give you both versions. So in aperture priority mode, we change the main dial to adjust the aperture and the camera makes adjustments to the shutter speed. So what I recommend you do is aperture priority mode, just take a picture of something, anything. It doesn't matter what it is. Press play, inspect the image, and we're going to pretend that we want the image to be brighter. This is where exposure compensation comes in. It's this little box here on the bottom of our rotating wheel. We're going to push this down, and you're going to get this all this funky information and numbers. See this little orange triangle? When we push this to the right, you're going to notice that the image is starting to get brighter on the back of the monitor. Let's turn it up to two. Now we're going to take the picture again. So if we were to compare the first picture with the second picture, you can see that it got brighter. This is the short answer. So if you want to change your image brightness in the P, A, or S modes, we're going to come in to exposure compensation and move this triangle to the right. Let's say it was too bright, we want to make it darker. In this case, we would move this orange triangle to the left. We're going to go to two here, take another picture. So when we inspect those three images, we went from an even exposure to a brighter exposure to a darker exposure. And in most cases, you're really not going to change it that much. It's going to be some, more something like one little tick mark. It's going to be something like maybe even that. Not a lot, but that is how we change our image brightness. If this is the only thing you take away from this lesson, you are well on your way to becoming a fantastic photographer because that is the skill set you're going to be using all the time. Now I'm going to give you a longer answer and I refer to this as philosophy of use. I am teaching you how to think in terms of the camera itself. And this is what really what the crash course, the advanced course is, is I go through these real world shooting situations and I show you the philosophies of use and how to change it. This is why the crash courses are fantastic investments because they're just a few hours long and you'll know your camera very quickly. What I want you to do when you are shooting is to keep an eye on your shutter speed. We want our shutter speed to be at least 1 60th of a second if we are hand holding the camera, preferably maybe even a little faster, 1 100th of a second, maybe even a little faster than that. And the reason is you move and your subject matter might be moving as well. If we are shooting sports, we might want it to be a lot faster, like one five hundredth of a second or one one thousandth of a second. What I'm saying is that when you're shooting in aperture priority mode, it really pays just to sneak a peek at your shutter speed often, just to make sure everything is fast enough. Otherwise, you might have blurry images. It's the number one problem that beginners struggle with. Why are my pictures blurry? It's because they're using slow shutter speeds. They're, they're relying on the camera to do most of the camera changes for them. In aperture priority mode, you are responsible to keep an eye on that. Now, the next thing I want you to do is to take your hand and move it in front of the camera, just like this. And I want you to look at what's happening with your shutter speed. Let's cover it up. See how much it's changing? What in the world is going on here? What's happening is that as we block light from entering the camera, the camera is adjusting the shutter speed to compensate for this. It's trying to use a longer shutter speed. Longer shutter speeds mean more light is coming into the camera. So what this means is, is that when we're in aperture priority mode, we determine the aperture, which is designated here, and the camera is going to determine the shutter speed. It's going to do this for us automatically. And the reason why this is important is because as we change our shooting conditions, if we go, let's say inside of a church, we're shooting a wedding, now we step out into the lobby, 
and now we step out into the sun, those are three different lighting conditions. And the camera would change the shutter speed for us automatically. And when I shot weddings, that's exactly how I did it. Why? Because I'm walking backwards and I didn't want to trip. And I'm trying to shoot the couple and I don't want to cha change my shutter speed as I'm shooting. So aperture priority is something that a lot of pros use all the time. I have no problem with aperture priority. And once you learn this, you're going to have that arrow in your quiver. So aperture priority mode, we determine the aperture. The camera determines the shutter speed based on the amount of light coming into the camera. When we talked about exposure compensation, we came into this menu and we told the camera to, hey, make it brighter or hey, make it not so bright. Come down this way. What is going on here? Something you'll notice is that we have two little tick marks between each number. And as we move one tick mark, it says 0 0.3, 0 0.7, and now it's at one. So what that means is that every tick mark is worth about one third of a value. What is this value, this number, plus one? I'm gonna prove it to you here real quick. Here we're shooting at one one hundred and sixtieth of a second. And when we change it to plus one, we tap our shutter button, come back out. We're now at one eightieth of a second, twice the amount of light twice as long as a shutter speed as it was before. So 1 60th and up here was 1 80th. So what these numbers mean, what they represent is referred to as a stop, one stop of light. One stop of light means twice the amount of light as it was before. If that's true and we were to continue to come up to plus two, what do you think the shutter speed would be? Tap a shutter button. If you said 1 40th of a second, you are absolutely correct. And this is, should be mostly true as we continue to come up. Plus three, plus three should be twice as long as plus two, one stop. So what would the shutter speed be? What is twice as long as 1 40th of a second? Well, we can do the math. 1 40th plus 1 40th is 2 40ths. If we simplify that, it should be 1 20th. And there it is. Now the same is true in the opposite direction. If it was too bright, we wanted to go this way. Let's just take a look at the shutter speed. There it is, one, 160th of a second. Let's go twice as fast. So this is twice as fast as one 160th of a second. Just do the math. If you said one 320th of a second, you are absolutely correct. When we're in aperture priority and we change our exposure compensation, we're telling the camera to cheat the brightness in one direction or the other. We designate that by the number of stops in that value. If you understand this concept, you are going to be crushing it because you understand how exposure compensation works. This is only for aperture priority mode. We can also use it in shutter priority mode, S. Shutter priority mode is the opposite of aperture priority mode. In shutter priority mode, when we adjust the main dial, it changes the shutter speed, and the camera is going to try to make adjustments to the aperture. You can see it changing here now. So what's going on when this aperture starts flashing? There. Basically, the orange highlight means is that we have a shutter speed selected that is so fast that the aperture cannot open wide enough to make this happen. If you see this, the question you should be asking yourself is how do we get that flashing to stop? Camera's not happy. And you might be shooting an indoor sporting event where you need something like one one thousandth of a second. The camera's really unhappy. See how dark it's going to be? This isn't gonna work. How can we change a setting to make this happen? If you said ISO, you're absolutely correct. Our ISO is a gain or boost in the signal of the light coming in to make it brighter. When we select ISO 5000, the flashing stops. The camera's happy. This is resolved and it's saying, yeah, this is gonna work. The question a lot of beginners have is this, well, if that's the truth, why don't we just turn our ISO up all the time and just have it really, really high? Well, there's a problem with ISO. And the problem is, is that the higher this number is, the more grain we are going to see. Let me demonstrate it for you real quick. I'm gonna turn up my ISO to 12,800. And I'm going to take a picture and we're going to look at it. You're going to see this little magnifying glass. We can zoom in. And my blinds are pure white. 
you can kind of see it, this grain, this dirty grain here. That's high ISO noise. Let's do it again. I'm gonna turn my ISO way down and we're just gonna use a longer exposure. I'll turn it down to like 400. And now I'm going to adjust my shutter speed so there's a nice even exposure here. Take it again. Oh, take two. If we were to come in and take a look, you can see that the grain is no longer there. So lower ISOs are going to have less grain, higher ISOs are gonna have a lot more grain. It's, that's the short answer. There's a longer answer to that. If you are a subscriber to my YouTube channel, check out the video called Shot Noise. That is what our ISO is doing for us. And the truth of the matter is, I almost never use shutter priority. Why? Because I can accomplish almost everything that I want in either manual or aperture priority. And so beginners will ask, well, what about sports shooting? Even for sports shooting, I am typically shooting on aperture priority. And the reason is, I can dial in my aperture and I turn the shutter speed over to the camera and all I do is I'm just sneaking peaks over to make sure the shutter speed's fast enough. And this is important because outside on a sunny day, all of a sudden here comes a cloud and you don't wanna have to fumble with your shutter speed. Let the camera take care of it. So I personally shoot in aperture priority a lot for sport shooting. We've talked about aperture priority. We've talked about shutter priority. Let's visit program mode real quick. Program mode is a little weird. And you can see here that it's telling us we can change our program mode setting with both our main dial and the wheel on the back. Program mode is a little bit different because when we change those settings, both the shutter speed and the aperture change as well. It's going to give us these different combinations and we could sneak a peek and look at the shutter speed and, and try to tweak it this way. Again, I'm not a huge believer in program mode. The only time I use program mode is when I am shooting event photography with a strobe and I'm walking around through a crowd. And the reason is it keeps my shutter speed and my aperture in a range that works well with the flash. That's the short answer. But if you change your main or your secondary wheel, what you're going to see is the camera is changing these different settings. You can still come in and do exposure compensation if you want, but the camera is going to be making those decisions for us. Let's talk about manual mode. Manual mode is awesome. And the reason is we tell the camera the shutter speed, the aperture, and the ISO. It doesn't change these things at any time. The reason manual is great is because it allows you to dial in set exposure values and you know what you're going to get. This is important, especially when you're shooting in studios with strobes. If I have enough time, I am shooting on manual. If it's an event and I'm moving around quickly, I tend to shoot more on aperture priority. In manual mode, the main dial, you can see, is changing the aperture. In the secondary wheel, on the back, is changing the shutter speed. So aperture and shutter speed. We, of course, can also change our ISO if we wanted to. But something you will notice is on the bottom here is that our exposure compensation is now MM. What this means is if we were to come in and try to select exposure compensation, the camera says, nope, cannot do this unless you're an auto ISO. MM stands for manual metering. And what's happening here is the camera is saying, this is just an, a prediction of how underexposed your image is going to be. You can see it's a little bit darker. And if the image was brighter, it's a plus value. It's just basically telling us how under or overexposed the image will be. In manual mode, there is usually no exposure compensation. So why am I saying usually? Because we have an incredible feature called auto ISO, which means if we come into our ISO and we scroll up, you're going to see it here up, up at the top. When we select auto ISO, we will see it designated in the ISO column. And what this means is that as we adjust our shutter speed and our aperture, the camera will make adjustments to our ISO. The most useful point for this, I believe, is indoor sports photography. When we know we want, let's say, a particular aperture, and we know we want a particular, I don't know, shutter speed. See, auto ISO is not happy. We'll have to come in there and adjust it. The idea of this is that we could dial in a specific shutter speed. We could dial in a specific aperture, and the camera would make any changes required to the ISO. So some images would have more grain, some images would have less. But indoor sports, MMA, boxing, basketball, the lighting conditions can change pretty quickly. You're not gonna be able to adjust it 
you know, on the fly as it's happening. This gives the camera the ability to help us when we're shooting those kinds of events. We can even determine the range of the auto ISO by coming into our ISO. If we continue to push right, this is the low value, the minimum, and we can also set the high value. So if 6400 wasn't doing it, we could come up to 12,800. We can come all the way up to the max if we wanted to, just know it's gonna be really, really grainy. I think Sony cameras do pretty well up to 12,800, depending on how much light you have. So I'm just gonna turn mine there. And another thing you're going to notice is we have this multi-frame noise reduction. This is how much noise reduction we want applied to each image. And the reason why this is important is because if it's applied, it can slow it down. So if you have a very high degree of noise reduction, you know, you might want to come in here and adjust that. For now, we'll just leave it on standard. I know that is a lot of information that I've thrown at you. We've talked about how to change the image brightness. We've talked about each of the modes. We've talked about changing the shutter speed, the aperture, the ISO. We've talked about auto ISO. We've talked about specific shutter speeds. I think the only one I didn't really mention is really fast running athletes. You're going to want a faster shutter speed, maybe one one thousandth. Let's talk about our camera's white balance, which is how it interprets different light coming into the camera. Press C1 button to come into our white balance. If you are just getting started, leave it on auto white balance, AWB. Auto white balance is going to be close enough about 70 to 80% of the time. It's going, for beginners, it's great because you have a lot of other things you're worried about like exposure and focusing. What will happen though, is that as you are shooting, eventually you're going to get into a situation where the color looks a little bit off. It's gonna be like blue or yellow or orange and you're gonna be going like, what the heck is going on? That is typically a white balance problem. And the reason why this happens is because the camera sees light differently depending on what temperature it is, whether it's the sun or a fluorescent light or a light bulb. We'll get into a little bit of that philosophy in just a second. But the idea on white balance is that we have these little icons below auto white balance. And the idea is that we set it to the icon of the type of light we are shooting in. So the sun is daylight. Little house with shade is the shade. If you're shooting in shade, it's different type of light. And we have the cloud, incandescent light. You can see how blue it made the screen. Then we have different types of fluorescent light. Then we have flash. Something I love about Sony cameras, it has an underwater white balance. Then we have temperature, which I'll demonstrate in just a second. We have custom white balances. So there's tons of different options. And this happens, and I've seen this in the Facebook group, or somebody will come back and they'll say, why are all my pictures blue? It's a white balance problem. You probably changed it to your light bulb icon and you didn't change it back. Something else I wanna point out is that you'll notice we have this little arrow to the right. So if we push to the right on our rotating wheel, we come in to the white balance adjustment. We get this little color swatch here. And as we continue to push in each direction, we're moving this little orange dot around on that color swatch. When all the values are zero, it means it's even. What this is allowing us to do is to customize, you can see the color changing a little bit, is to customize our white balance and tweak it. Most of the time, I do not use this. However, when I'm shooting video, I will come in and tweak this just a little bit, usually like a half value in different directions. In the beginning, don't worry about it. So we're gonna hit the menu button to cancel. Pure beginners, auto white balance, intermediate shooters, practice changing your white balance depending on the type of light you're shooting in. Another note I need to make is that if you're shooting in raw, this isn't going to matter as much because raw retains most of the color information and you would be able to process that and post. A lot more important for JPEGs to get it right, especially if you're recording video. A couple things I wanna demonstrate real quick is that if we come to the very, very bottom, we have something called custom white balance. So custom white balance allows us to take a picture of something and tell the camera, hey, this is white. So the way we wanna do that is highlight this little icon here that says set. We're gonna press the set button. It's going to say press the set button again to capture data of the central area of the screen. So I'm shooting in white blinds. And when I push the set button, it's going to sample that area and set it up. You can see it changed the color it's telling us we have a Kelvin temperature of 5,000 with a slight shift in magenta. Is this what you want? We're gonna hit yes. And you can see the color of the monitor has changed and we're custom white balanced to these blinds. When I am shooting video, 
I tend to use custom white balance a little more because when you're in mixed lighting conditions, it's not the easiest thing to kind of manually dial it in the way I'm about to show you. And it, you can use things like the wall, a bride's dress, the ceiling, piece of paper. You can just throw it in front of the camera, sample the light that you're shooting in, and it should be pretty accurate, it should be pretty close. Coming back to the C1 button. So that's your custom white balance, and we have three different slots that it will remember. We also have this guy in here, which says custom temperature. It says C temp slash filter. Without getting into too much of the explanation, K stands for Kelvin. And what this means is, is that every light source has its own different temperature rating. There's a long story behind this in, in terms of the, the theory of it and how it works, but suffice to say that a bright sunny day, sunlight, is 5600K. If you were to shoot with a light bulb, light bulbs are typically 3200 to 3400K. And you'll notice that as I turned the camera down to that setting, the screen became blue. Now, the reason why this happens is because lower Kelvin temperatures tend to be more yellow. And there's an easy way to remember this. Think of a candle light as a low Kelvin temperature. It's orange, it's yellow. Think of a high Kelvin temperature like a blue blowtorch, very, very hot. What's happening is the camera is counteracting the type of light we're shooting in. So if we're shooting in candlelight, 2600K, you can see this blue, and that blue is to counteract the yellowness of that lower Kelvin temperature light. If we were to go up to a blue blowtorch temperature, really, really hot Kelvin, now it's orange to also counteract that blue light. So the heart of the matter with color Kelvin is blue to yellow, and typically the camera is going to try to counteract the light that it's shooting in. So that's a very deep philosophy of use. Typically, I don't tell that to beginners. I just say, hey, auto white balance, 5600K is outdoors. Tungsten light is 3400 to 3200. Those are gonna cover most of the shooting situations you're in. And there are some deeper discussions we could definitely have on it. But for now, pure beginner, auto white balance. If you are shooting video and you know the temperature of light you're shooting in, you can come in here and set your Kelvin. You can also come in and do a custom white balance if you're shooting in mixed lighting conditions. And that's a quick overview of white balance. Let's tackle our camera's focusing modes. This can be very confusing and very intimidating for beginners. That said, the focusing systems in the Sony Alpha 6000 series cameras, especially recently, they're incredible. Among the very best in the world that I've seen and they continue to improve with firmware updates. So it's, it's gonna be worth investing a little bit of time into learning all of our options in terms of how we can use them. The way I teach this is the how the when and the where. If you can break it down to the how, when, and where, you're gonna be off to a great start. So how does the camera focus? We already talked about this. When we push a shutter button halfway down, camera engages its focusing systems. You can see this indicated with little green boxes on our target. We also get this little green circle in the bottom left-hand corner. Push the shutter button down all the way to take the picture. So that's how we focus. And there are some other ways I will demonstrate near the end of this lesson. The next part of this equation is the when, whether it's a one-time focus or whether it's over and over and over again. We can access the camera's auto-focusing modes by default by pressing the C2 button. This will open our focusing mode menu. AFS stands for Auto Focus Single, means the camera will get a focusing lock. You can see it's designated over here, AFS, when this happens, the camera gets focus one time. I push the shutter button halfway down. We can see those indicators again. And as I move the camera left to right, the focus will not change as long as I am holding that shutter button halfway down. This can be very useful, for example, if we get focus lock on something and we want to recompose the image to make it more aesthetically pleasing. It's gonna be better when we're not shooting at very, very wide apertures, but AFS means a single focus, that stays locked, it will not change until we push a shutter button down all the way. AFC stands for Auto Focus Continuous. This is not a one-time focus. This means the camera will be focusing over and over and over again. When we engage the halfway shutter button depression, you will notice that now we get these parentheses in the bottom left-hand corner. We do not hear a beep. And you can see that those green boxes are kind of flickering, it means they're updating. AFC is perfect 
for moving subjects, people running, kids, maybe animals flying, things of that nature. Great for sports shooting. So that is the main difference between a single focus, which is better for still subjects, versus continuous focus, which is better for moving subjects. When we come back in to our C2 button, you'll also notice that we have automatic AF. And this is a hybrid of the first two. We give the camera permission to determine whether or not the subject is moving. So in this case, it's not moving. AFS, if it was a moving subject and it was working perfectly, it would jump over to AFC. When I shot weddings, I used to use the equivalent of AFA a lot. I don't do it anymore. I usually just pick one or the other, one shot or AF continuous. We also have manual focus. And manual focus is exactly what it sounds like. We use the focusing ring, I have a focus assist tool turned on, which punches in the zoom. And I'm rotating the ring until I get precise focus lock. There it is, great. So literally the camera will not focus when we push that halfway shutter button, pressing down, nothing's happening. All of the focus is done with the, the manual focus ring on the lens. Typically when I'm shooting video, high-end video, I will be using manual focus if I'm operating the camera. If I'm in front of the camera and I'm doing a YouTube video, I will have face detection and I'll demonstrate that in just a second. Coming back in, we also have direct manual focus, which is a hybrid between autofocus and manual focus. The way this works is that we press a halfway shutter button depression, and while holding this down, we can rotate our autofocus ring and jump into manual. Kind of see it there. So it's a little bit of a hybrid of both, but it requires us to push and hold the shutter button halfway down and then rotate the focus ring. So we've talked about the how, we've now talked about the when, which is how often the camera is engaging autofocus. And now we're going to talk about the where, which deals with our camera's focusing clusters. We can access the focusing clusters by pressing C3. And in the beginning, by default, the camera is going to be set up to wide. The way this works is the camera is looking for an area of contrast. And in the case of this target, it's there, it's pretty straightforward, and it's using the whole viewfinder. Coming back in, we also have the ability to choose zone. And you'll notice that when we choose zone, those boxes are highlighted to be white. And we're, I'm using the directional pad to move them around. I could also touch and drag, tap on our touchscreen monitor. Very useful. Now there's a problem with this, is that what if we wanted to change our display or our ISO. Well, now it's changing these focusing squares. And so the way we jump out of this is that we push the set button in, and now we can come back in to the different options and features we have. We can still touch on the screen to move around if we wanted to. So the reason why this zone is particularly useful is because it isolates a specific area for the camera to look in. Now it's only going to look within the corners of this box. There is the target. When I use this in conjunction with my YouTube videos, I, you'll notice on my YouTube videos, I'm usually standing on the left and I turn face detection on it. I'm just telling the camera, hey, look in this area for my face. And it does a fantastic job of doing it. Coming back down, we have a center focusing point. Kind of hard to see, but you'll notice that we have these four little corners. The center focusing square is isolated to the direct center of the camera. And there's been a, a new update on this in that in the past, this was pretty much locked. But now what happens is on any of the focusing modes, we can touch on the monitor and change that focusing square to a different position. If we don't want that, we can hit our set button and it jumps back to the original focusing mode. Maybe that's a lot of information. The ones that I use the most are the flexible spot modes. And these are great because we get three different sizes. There's a large. You can see that I can move this around. Again, I can touch and drag, move it around, but we can also change the size of this single focusing square by coming in and selecting small. You can see this teeny example or medium. It's a medium size box. Again, we can touch and drag on the monitor. This is typically what I have it set up for. Almost 90% of the time, I'm on a large focusing box. And when we're not in that mode, we can still come in here and touch to move that around. I think 
when I'm shooting off the back monitor, this is what, what I prefer to do. And in the past, the Sony cameras didn't have this on the first versions of this. So this is really nice that we can touch on the monitor and determine where the camera is focusing. When I am looking through the viewfinder, I almost always jump back to the directional pad, which you'll notice this brings a problem as you're looking through the viewfinder. So when this is turned off and you're not getting those white arrows, you can push the set button and this will allow you to use the directional pad as a joystick. Very useful when looking through the viewfinder. I am left-eyed shooter, so I prefer to change my focusing square over here. There are some ways we can do it with a touchpad, but my nose bumps the monitor and it's always changing it. So when I'm looking through the viewfinder, I have this turned off. We also have our expandable flexible spot. This is a little bit different in that it gives the camera a precise square and then an outer box that we're giving the cam camera permission to look in. So there's a slight expand. Now there are some other really powerful focusing clusters down here and you'll notice it's turned off. It's not highlighted. It says tracking expand flexible spot. When it's turned off like that, it wants us to be in a continuous focusing mode. And you'll notice that once we jump to that, come back, here it is. Now we can highlight it. Anytime you see something grayed or unselectable, it's because we have another setting somewhere that's turned on and the camera doesn't like. But I wanna demonstrate how this works. It is super powerful. And the idea on it is that when we get a subject in focus, halfway shutter button depression, there are algorithms that are going to track that moving subject. As long as we're holding that shutter button halfway down, I have gone out to the park and tested this. It is very good. It works better on a single subject. When you have multiple subjects running in front of each other, like soccer game or a football game, it's not really the preferred method, but it will track a moving subject very well if there is high contrast on a clean background, it's amazing. So it's something you should be aware of and something you should have in your arsenal. Go out and practice it. So we have talked about the how, which is halfway shutter button depression. We have talked about the when, which deals with single versus continuous versus manual. And we've talked about the where, which is the camera's focusing clusters. So a very common question I get is how do we set the camera up for back button focus for sports shooting? So let me show you how to set it up. And I'll tell you about why you want to do this. Part of the problem with Sony's menu systems is they can be extremely confusing, even for somebody like me who's, who's owned Sony cameras for, this will be my sixth year. What we need to do is to remove the autofocus from the halfway shutter button depression. We're going to find it on page six, the red tab. We're going to come down to autofocus with shutter button and we're going to turn that to off. And this is why it gets confusing, is we have to designate this back button to work for autofocus. We need to come into our custom keys. We'll talk a little bit more about this when we cover it in the deep menu section, but you'll notice that each custom key has a different icon in front of it. We have an image film playback. So this means when we're shooting stills, we can customize our keys. Come into here. So we have this autofocus manual focus control hold. And I like that. Let me demonstrate what this does real quick. When we push and hold this button down, it allows me to jump into manual focus by rotating the lens. So this allows me to get right into manual focus. It's nice. When I release it, now I'm back in autofocus. I'm gonna turn that off. So what I wanna do with back button focus is I'm going to designate it under the AEL designation of the switch, which is really auto exposure lock. So when we push this, it's supposed to lock the exposure, which is designated here. But I'm gonna change that now in the menu. We come into custom key. This is really nice because it gives us an overview of over which buttons we're changing, it tells us what we have designated. I'm gonna come into AEL hold. This is the one I wanna customize. And I'm looking for AF on. It wants us to go side to side. Look at all the options. Definitely a lot of information here. Oh, it's giving us the pages. AF on. So these pages run parallel to the different tabs. So if we want to find something specific, so it should be on page six, right? Of the red tab, there it is. So now this is AF on. And if I wanted to engage the cameras focusing with AEL, I'd flip down and I could push it into the camera body and we're good to go. Back button focusing is really great when sports shooting because we determine when the camera is focusing or not. That's the gist of it. Pretend that target is a moving athlete and I'm shooting up, 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 right? So if I'm using a regular shutter button depression, focus, 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 
and I recompose, now it's gonna focus on the background. So this gives us more control over determining when the camera is focusing or not. By simply lifting up our thumb, we can recompose, fire away, and we would basically be close enough in that same focal plane. And, and that's a huge advantage for fast moving action like sports shooting. If you change this and you forget, it's gonna drive you crazy. So I'm gonna change this back real quick. And that is how we set up our camera for back button focus. Let's talk about face and eye detection. You'll notice that when we were coming in to the different menus, when we had our black menu, here it is, there's our face detection. And then when we had our shooting menu, we have this face detection turned on. There is a way we can turn this on or off. If we press the FN button, you'll notice we don't have it in this quick drop down menu. And I kind of like to have it there. So what I want to do is I'm going to put my face detection in this bottom right hand corner. So I'm going to show you how to customize your function menu real quick. We're going to come into purple tab function menu set the mode dial. It doesn't make sense to have our shooting mode in that bottom right hand corner because we can see it at the top. So I'm going to change this. So this is a little confusing because it's called something else, but we're basically going to select face and eye priority in autofocus. We select that, tap the shutter button, press the FN button, and there we have changed our function menu to give us access to face and eye detection here. We press this and we can come in and turn it off if we wanted to. Something you will notice is that when face detection is turned on, we get this box around our model's face. The model came to help us out. And when I push a shutter button halfway down, you're going to notice Something interesting is happening here. I'll go back to single. Is that when the face detection falls outside of the cluster that we're using, the cluster gets the, de the attention. I'm using my set button to move this. When the cluster and the face box match up, you can see it jumped into the eye detection. Sony really revolutionized eye detection. Back in the day, when I was a wedding photographer, we would have to move a, a little square over our model's eyes. It was very tricky. You would miss a lot. You couldn't really recompose if you were shooting very, very wide apertures because of a shallow depth of field. Here comes Sony. Hey, let's just make it to, you know, lock onto the eye. And lo and behold, higher percentage of keepers, higher degree of accuracy. They continue to improve it. It's really, it's the best I've seen. It's the best in the world. Sony has the best eye detection in the world. And the A6600 is the flagship of the APS-C cameras. I was reading on Facebook the other day, can you start a professional wedding and portrait business with the APS-C Sony cameras? Answer is absolutely yes, completely. Now, in the past when you would zoom out, there's, there's gonna come a point when the face becomes so small that the camera can't detect the algorithm, but it's improved so much recently that that box is really small. It's pretty much going to be able to find that face most of the time if they're looking at you. But keep this in mind, if we are dealing with a focusing square that does not match up where your shooter's face is. What I do when I am shooting for, say YouTube, is I'll, I'll come into a zone and I'll have this zone pattern over where my face is going to be. It's not on there, it's gonna to default to those squares. Very important to keep in mind. As a side note, on previous Sony cameras in the past, the default was pushing into the set button and it would jump into eye focus. It's not the case anymore because we need it to determine where these focusing squares are going to be able to move. So you would have to move IAF, if you wanted a quick hot button to a specific key, I kind of like the AEL where we had back button focus, depending on whether or not you're a portrait photographer or a sports photographer, I think that's the best place for it. And we would customize it in the same way. Coming up to custom key, we'll go to this guy and we're looking for IAF, there it is. And what this means, when it is set up this way, IAF set on the AEL, is that when we engage that anywhere in the frame, it's gonna get that eye lock. Really powerful if you're a portrait photographer, if you shoot kids a lot, you know, things of that nature where you just wanna get that eye focus, you don't have to fumble with any of the buttons, just boom, right there. So that is eye detection. While we're on the topic of focusing, there's a couple menu items and tools I wanna demonstrate. Red tab, page six. Face and eye auto focus set. When you come in here, we have the ability to turn on face and eye detection, turn it off. We can determine whether this is a human or a, an animal subject, pretty cool. We have the ability to determine whether we want the right eye or the left eye. When it's in auto, the camera will decide. This gray frame that we see, we can also turn off if we don't wanna see it. Same thing with the animal eye display, we can turn that off as well. So yeah, it should work on dogs and cats, certain animals, you will notice. In these other tools, I wanna point out page 13, 
red tab. The focus magnifier, if you select it from here, you're going, going to get this box. We can change the magnification by pressing into the set button. Almost six and almost 12. It wants us to come back in and reactivate the box each time we use it. How long do you want it to be magnified for? Two seconds, five seconds, or no limit. The initial magnification when we're using, so when we're using something like manual focus assist, one time or six times, almost six times. The manual focus assist is the punch in. It's that zoom in we get when we are using manual focus. So if we turn this off and we jump into our manual focus, when it's turned off, we don't get the punch in. When it is turned on, come back out, then we get the punch in. There it is. This guy here, autofocus and focus magnification. You have to have your camera on to an autofocus mode. Let's just make sure that we do come in here. Okay, we're on autofocus single. When we use the focus magnifier, it means that we can engage the autofocus with a halfway shutter button depression. We can continue to zoom in. For manual focusing, however, probably one of the coolest tools that I think. When we're talking about manual focus, a tool you should absolutely be aware of is peaking. Peaking is a color overlay that is going to appear in the areas of sharpest contrast. It's not always precise depending on how wide your aperture is, but it will definitely tell you ballpark more or less where the camera is focusing. First thing we need to do is to turn it on. I'm going to turn it on to a high level of display. There's also medium and low. And I like to select red because it shows really well. Tap the shutter button, you can immediately see it the focus peaking is going to highlight in red in the areas that are in focus if we use the focus magnifier and punch in. If we use our focusing ring in manual focus, it'll automatically punch in and we can see it. This is very useful when we are shooting with a video and we want to know exactly how deep our depth of field is. Very important to note that this should only be working in manual. So if you're frustrated that you don't see it in an autofocus mode, that's why it is pretty much a manual focusing tool, and that is referred to as peaking. Come in here and turn that off. While we're on the topic of focusing, I should mention that in the yellow tab, page three, we have our touch panel, touch pad settings. The touch panel is this back monitor when you do not have the camera up to your face. When you put the camera up to your eye and you're looking, this becomes the touch pad. So what it's saying here, touch panel, touch pad, it means that the touch sensitivity is active in these different states. For both of them, for the back monitor only, or when we're looking through the viewfinder. When I shoot, I am left eye dominant, which means my nose is bumping into the screen. I typically tend to go with touch panel only because I don't, I don't like using the monitor when I'm looking through the viewfinder. If this is turned on, we can adjust touch pad settings where it'll work in the horizontal and vertical orientation. We could turn it off if we didn't want vertical orientation. Touch position. I like absolute. That's just me. If you just wanted to limit it to a certain area, you could select relative. It's This is going to be preference, whatever you prefer. I would say try both of them. Absolute means it's the entire screen. Relative means you're going to use a smaller portion. And then when we go to the operation area, this is going to allow us to determine what part of this touch monitor is sensitive as we're looking through the viewfinder. So if you are left eyed dominant and you're looking through the viewfinder, you're probably going to want to pick an area where you're not bumping into your nose. Some people use it on the left side. I don't recommend that when you use heavy lenses, there's nothing to put under the lens, but depending on where your nose is, it may be up here, upper right half, the far quarter, whatever it is. And then when you get that position, designated with the black part of the square. So then when you're looking through the viewfinder, you should be able to touch on the screen and move it around. So that is the touch pad and touch panel settings. Probably a pretty good idea to also talk about focusing options when we are shooting video. So I flip this over to video. You notice it gets a little bit of a punch in. There is a crop factor on our sensor. It's 1.5. If we notice how it jumps in and out. What's happening is it's punching in just a little bit when we are shooting 30 frames per second or 60 frames per second. We wouldn't see that at 24 frames per second. It should be the same. But the idea on this is that there's a couple different tools I want to point out and make you aware of when you're shooting video. We have eye detection for video, which is an awesome feature. It means it's going to be more precise that as we track and get closer to our subjects, you'll notice at a certain point, the real estate kicks into eye detection. Lower end Sony a6000 series cameras do not have this feature. It's an awesome, wonderful feature. If you do a lot of 
face recording. You'll notice we still got the face box. Something else you should notice is that when you come into your focusing modes, we cannot select single shot. So it's either continuous or you're going to go with manual focus. Continuous means the camera is going to be tracking continuously. And something that's really cool about this, remember we have this touch square? We can touch on the camera and tell where to focus with touch operation. Back in the day, I'd say probably within the last five years, if you wanted to change the focus of your camera for video, you had to do it manually. You actually had to go out and buy gears and wheels and this is still how it's done in Hollywood is that we have a very complex rig that we put on the camera and we'll have somebody actually change the focus manually. Well, with, with a touch sensitive monitor like this, we can touch on the screen and tell the camera where we want it to focus. So you'll notice it's not letting me change. What I'm going to do is put a different lens on so you can see the difference a little bit easier. So I put a 24 to 70 2.8G master on. I'm gonna come into the menu and I need to change the video settings, which is something that I recommend you do it's on program mode right now. I almost always shoot on manual mode. We'll turn off these little previews as well in a second. So now I'm on manual mode and now I have the control to change my aperture and my shutter speed. Let's do something faster. I'm gonna turn this down. You guys can see it here. So now when I'm at 2.8, I touch on here versus touching on here and the camera is changing the focus. It's a very powerful tool. So we have face detection in continuous. We have touch focus where we can touch and change. If we were to track a moving subject and you put it on the square, it should be focusing continuously where the square is. See that? Kind of hard to see, but it is changing the focus. Very smooth, it's very fast, it's very accurate. We could also come in to manual focus and we have the same tools that we had there before. We can also come in to our menu Turn on peaking for video. Kind of hard to see, but there it is. Tons of great focusing tools. If you want to punch in and look at something, something I want to demonstrate is that when we are in the video mode, our customizations can be different. So if this is the case, instead of having a toggle button that we push and hold for autofocus, manual focus, we can push it to actually switch over and then we can actually get a magnification in AEL. So let me show you how to set that up real quick. I think it's super useful. So when, you, when we come in here for the video, it says follow the custom for stills. And we know this is control hold, which means we wanna push and hold it down to jump from autofocus to manual. We want something that says AFMF toggle. So we can push it once and it'll change. Control toggle. Here it is. So now when we push this button, it'll jump back and forth between these two. And then what we wanna do is change this guy. So we're gonna select focus magnifier. We could also come in and customize our C3 button, which we may not want to do, but we also have the garbage can icon, which is C4 down here. So with this in mind, let me show you how these two guys now work. So if we're in the video mode and I push this button, now I'm in manual focus, we can see that with our peaking. So your peaking's there. If we want to go back to autofocus, there I am. So that's a really fast, easy way to jump in and out of autofocus and manual focus. So let's say I'm in manual focus and I want to jump over to the magnify button. So wherever that focusing square is, wherever we move it, if we want to jump in to magnify, there's our box. And so it gives us a quick, easy way to jump in to manual focus without needing to go into the menu. I can flip this back up, come into autofocus. That's just me personally. It's the way I like to shoot when I'm using video. I don't wanna to have to flip the switch to manual on the side of the lens or things of that nature. Very, very fast control. So I demonstrate this on the crash course. There's a bunch of different focusing methods. If you were to shoot a documentary, if you're shooting a vlog, if you're shooting a running athlete, those are three different sets right there. Sometimes how do you focus in empty space, manual focus. So the subject matter that you shoot is going to determine the focusing method that you use. And again, that's all covered on the crash course. Let's talk about our camera's metering modes. And by default, your metering modes, you can access in the function menu, FN menu, metering mode, it's this little icon right here. And by default, we have our evaluative metering mode. We can change them by selecting and then coming into each of these. Metering modes give instructions to the camera that help it to determine the exposure based on where light is coming into the camera. That's the short answer. The default is the evaluative metering mode that breaks the screen up into different zones. 
there's different quadrants and the camera makes some measurements. Now the easiest way for me to explain this is in the spot metering mode. So we're gonna come into the spot metering mode right here. And you'll notice that when we do this, we get this little circle in the middle. Look at the exposure settings, one 125th and 2.8, right? So wherever I'm pointing this, those exposure settings are pretty much the same. But the moment we move that over this bright headlamp, the exposure settings change. So what's happening in spot metering mode is we're giving instructions to the camera to only look within that little circle. And that's how it's deciding which shutter speed to use. If we come into the metering mode again, there's actually a standard and a large circle. So we have a bigger circle now. It's outside the circle. Doesn't change quite as much as it did before. It's kind of measuring that whole circle, but that's how you would change your spot metering. We also have the ability to link our spot metering mode to our focusing square. And we can do this in the menu, red tab, page eight, where we have our metering mode, we have face priority multi, we'll talk about that in a second, spot metering point. So we can link our spot metering to our focusing point. So watch what happens now is that as I move the focusing square, we can see that little circle popping up. Boom, there it goes. I think that's more useful when we have a focusing square and then spot metering linked together. So that's just me personally that I leave it there. Another cool feature about this is if we come into the menu, face priority in multi-metering. Basically what this means is that when we have our multi-metering mode on with face detection is it is going to set the exposure based on the face. Very, very useful if you're shooting portraits, things of that nature, because sometimes you'll have highlights coming into the corners and we don't want the camera to be tricked or fooled. So if you're shooting portraits with eye or face detection, it should change the exposure settings based on what it's metering off the person's face. So there are some other metering modes. There's center weighted, which expands the area. It's a greater area in the center. We have the entire screen average, where it just takes an average of everything from corner to corner. And then the metering based on highlights. You can see that the camera shifted there as I went to it, where we're giving instructions to the camera to meter based on the brightest highlight that it finds across the frame. It's not going to be quite as much as when we're using spot metering. But as we change the amount of light coming into the camera, it changes the exposure settings in the PS and A modes. And that is why the metering mode is important. In the beginning, my recommendation would be just to stick with multi-metering until you get to a situation where you're shooting heavy backlight and you wanna start playing around with spot metering or linking it to a focusing square. Let's take a look at the deep menu system. And I've been shooting Sony cameras now for five years and they are still confusing to me. So if you are confused, don't feel bad. They are broken up into different tabs on the top and then we get different pages within those tabs. So red is mostly for stills shooting. Come down, you can navigate by pushing on the directional pad. There's this, you want to naturally push on the screen but for whatever reason, Sony hasn't activated touch screen navigation for the menu. So we have to use the directional pad. Red is for still shooting. Purple is for mostly movies. There's some other settings in there we'll be talking about. We have our network settings, which deals with the Wi-Fi, and I'll show you how to connect to your smartphone. We have our playback, which is blue. Orange are the camera settings. And then we have a gray tab, which is customizable. The My Menu setting allows us to access those features that we use most of the time so we can add them in here and I'll demonstrate that as well. Also important to note that you're going to be seeing these little icons in here. The little mountain in a square refers to a still image and the film strip refers to video. We'll be seeing some other things here and there that I'll be pointing out. The thing that's the most confusing to me is sometimes you want things to be close to each other, but they're not. They're actually in different menus and there's no easy way to remember where all these things are. Let me make some recommendations for beginners. On the crash course, I'll go into far greater detail, philosophies of use, things of that nature. File format deals with whether we're shooting JPEG or RAW, or JPEG and RAW. If you're a pure beginner, I typically say start off with JPEG. If you are shooting RAW, you're probably going to want to get something like Lightroom or Photoshop to process those RAW files, but in the beginning, JPEG's fine. JPEG quality deals with the compression 
This is essentially when the processor looks at adjacent pixels and decides if two colors are close enough. They're going to throw away, it's going to throw away some information and make a smaller file size. If you're just starting and you're worried about this, you can go to extra fine. I know a lot of pro wedding photographers who shoot fine, which is half the file size and they can't even see the difference. JPEG image size, I recommend large, which is 24 megapixels. Typically it's a lot easier to go from a large megapixel image to a small megapixel image. A lot harder to go from a small megapixel image and try to up res it, never looks good. Aspect ratio deals with the proportions of the frame that we're shooting with. Three by two is the complete sensor. My dad loves shooting 16 by nine. Long exposure noise reduction essentially means, and it wants us to change the drive setting so this doesn't work in a burst mode. And you're gonna see this a lot is when things are grayed out you're going to try to select it. It doesn't let you. Long exposure noise reduction is when we take an image over one second, the camera will clean up some of that noise grain. It, this applies to JPEGs only. Same with high ISO noise reduction. I recommend leaving this on. Applies to JPEGs. If you have really grainy images, it'll clean it up. And so when I'm going to go to the next page, over here we have 14 pages in the red tab. I'm just going to push right on the directional pad and we can kind of keep track of it there two two out of 14. color space should be srgb unless you're shooting for a magazine and you're aware of what adobe rgb is lens compensation means that the lenses the sony lenses that we attach to our camera body are recognized and the camera body has the ability to clean up problems with the shading in the corners also referred to as vignetting. Chromatic aberration is a blue or a yellow fringing that you'll see in high contrast areas. Distortion is when we're shooting with wide angle lenses. So this can all be cleaned up in camera in terms of the JPEGs and it definitely looks better. So if you're shooting lots of JPEGs and you have a great Sony lens on there, yeah, I recommend it. So we're already into page three. Scene selection, We've covered, it's this top scene mode on top of the wheel. It wants us to change to the scene mode over here. Not really a huge fan of it, but these are the, the modes that the camera kind of sets up for us, does most of the settings. It basically turns your camera into a point and shoot for specific situations. Drive modes we covered, they're right here. We can access them by pushing left on the directional pad. And you're gonna see a lot of this redundancy in the menus where we can come in and change it in the menu as well. So we talked about bracketing here when we come into the drive modes and you can see we talked about these continuous bracketing whether the camera would take all the images or we have to push a shutter button down all the way. And the differences in the menu is these bracketing settings allow us to add a timer. So we could add a two, five or 10 second timer for the bracket if, if we didn't wanna to touch the camera, didn't wanna shake it. You'll also notice we can control the order the zero is an even exposure, the negative is an underexposure, and the positive is an overexposure. So this changes the order of, when, of how the bracketing shots are taken. The interval shoot function is a built-in intervalometer where we can tell the camera to take images at specific intervals, like anywhere from one to however many seconds you want. So we choose when we want it to start, we choose how many seconds we want, it also gives us the total amount of time we will be shooting for with those intervals, the number of shots, even auto exposure tracking. So if we want the exposure to change over time, and I demonstrate how to use these features on the crash course, how to do an interval timing shot. We go down to the beach and I demonstrate, you know, using this interval timing to capture a sunset and then you play it back and it looks like it's happening really fast. We can go with silent shooting. This would put it into an electronic mode. We have a ton of other features we cover in the crash course. Memory recall allows us to set the camera up the way we like it, and we can designate it to one of the memory slots on top of the camera, either one or two, and there's some additional slots that I'll show you how to set up. Let's pretend you're a sports shooter and you have the camera the way you like it. We're gonna go for a high burst, aperture priority, and we've, we've designated everything we like in the camera but we don't like to have to dial in these settings every time. We can come into the menu, come into memory recall, 
when we come into this screen, we get all the information in terms of how the camera is set up. And on the top, we see this one, two, M1, M2, M3. The one and the two refer to these numbers on the mode dial. So when we press the set button, it's going to memorize all of our camera settings on position one. When I rotate to position one, all of those settings are recalled. You'll notice it only has the one here. And when I rotate to two, it only has the two there. This allows us to, to memorize specific camera settings. So if you have settings for portrait versus maybe landscape, you could designate those into those two positions. So what are these M1, M2, and M3s? These are additional slots. So you would come in, set the camera up the way you want it, and save those settings to M1, M2, or M3. And then when you're ready to recall them, you would come in here and select the setting that you want. So we really get far more than two. It's like six settings, depending on how we're setting the camera up. Recall custom hold, this is a great example of why the menus are conf confusing, means that we can assign one of these to a specific button that when we press and hold it, it will remember certain camera settings that we set up when we come in here. So we could come in here and, and select and choose certain settings we want. Then we need to come back out to the menu and we need to come to page eight, because that makes perfect sense, right, as a pure beginner. And then we're gonna to go to custom key, and in this case it would be MF control, this button right here. And we would come in here and try to find the, the custom hold guy, where is he? Recall custom hold one. It essentially allows us to set up some settings that we can push and hold a button to bring those settings up while we're shooting. I don't ever use it, that's just me though. Page five, many of these we've talked about when we get into the focusing stuff, automatic. So these are our focusing modes that we can select in the menu. The priority set for autofocus single and autofocus continuous is asking what do you want the camera to prioritize first? Do you want it to focus or do you want it to release? Most of the time I leave it on balanced and here's the reason. When we set it to release, the camera will shoot at its maximum frames per second for that burst mode. Some of them will not be in focus. When we set it on autofocus, the frame rate tends to hesitate a little bit. So in my experience, I've had the best success with balance, both for autofocus single and autofocus continuous. The focus area has to do, again, with the clusters. It's a menu option to select them. Focus area limit allows us to determine which clusters will appear and when, so we can come in here and we're dealing with a tracking option. As we can see, there's tons of focusing cluster options, and if you want to just limit it to a certain number that you use, and there's some that you don't, you would come in here and deselect the ones you don't, and when you're shooting, those options would not appear in your cluster selection. Switch vertical horizontal autofocus area. If we turn this on, what's going to happen is the camera is going to remember the autofocus cluster and which point we were using when we rotate back and forth from horizontal to vertical. So in the horizontal position, it would be one square, and when we flip up, it would be in another. You can memorize the point only, or you can memorize the point and the cluster that we are using. I actually kind of like this, set to this setting, but for beginners it might be confusing as you're bouncing back and forth. I just think it's easier to shoot with this. Autofocus illuminator is a light that will turn on in dark conditions. The face and eye autofocus set, we've covered this already, it allows us to determine many of the face and eye detection settings, including whether we're dealing with humans or animals, which eye, do we want to display the frame, things of that nature. Auto focus with shutter, you're going to need this off if you want to set up back button focus. When you turn this off, if you, if you forget and you're not used to it, it'll drive you crazy. Pre-auto focus is something I do recommend turning off. When it's on, the camera will begin to focus whatever it's pointed at. I think it wears the battery down faster. It's just me personally. I think it's something I just leave off. I start autofocus deals with adapting A-mount lenses over to our E-mount body, so we're not going to worry about that. 
Autofocus area registration allows us to memorize a specific focusing square by pressing and holding other buttons down. For beginners, we're going to skip this. And we have the ability to delete those registered autofocus points. Autofocus area clear, I definitely recommend leaving off. If we turn this on, it will allow our focusing square to disappear after a certain amount of time, and that can be confusing for beginners. And in the wide and zone settings, we also have the ability to display the squares during continuous shooting. This is something I also recommend turning on, but if you don't want to see it, you can turn it off as well. So the circulation of the focusing point, I think the wording is confusing. I think this is a good idea to turn on. Let me demonstrate what it does real quick. Is we, is we have our focusing square, and it, as we move it to the edge, if we want it to jump around to the other side, we would continue to press in that direction. Same from top to bottom. I think that's easier than trying to go across the frame again. Just me personally, maybe. Auto focus micro adjustment is only going to work with certain lenses. I have a 24 to 70 2.8 G Master on here, and it won't even let me do it. So it just depends on your lens, and it'll allow you to adjust front or back focus. Our camera is using autofocus points built into the sensor, so it's measuring the focus in real time, and this is why it's not going to apply to many lenses, but I guess some older lenses or different lenses, we could come in and change the front and back focusing. Exposure compensation we've talked about. This is increasing or de decreasing the image brightness. We can change our ISO setting, our metering mode. Face priority and multi-metering we talked about. So in the metering lesson, we talked about how this will change the exposure when it recognizes a face. I think it's a cool feature. We can link spot metering with our focusing square. Talked about that also in the, in the metering lesson. I like one third intervals for our steps in terms of the exposure changing. Some people like half steps. Auto exposure lock with a halfway shutter button depression. If we didn't want that, we could turn it off. Exposure standard adjustment, we're going to skip. This allows us to adjust basically what the camera interprets as an even exposure. So for pure beginners, definitely don't mess with this because if you do, your camera is going to behave very differently. The A6600 does not have a built-in flash. We see it on some of the lower end, A6400, A6100. A6600, the ergonomics I feel are, are far better. It's, it's a bigger camera, it's a little bit heavier, but it feels great in the hand. And I think they tried to save some space for the IBIS by removing the flash. In the crash course, I talk about using an external speed light. It's a Godox TT685. I think it's the best value for the Sony cameras. It's like $110. There's also a commanding module, which will allow you to use the flash off the camera. It's great value. And we have about a 40 to 50 minute lesson on there that will get you started. When we're talking about flash, I always recommend making flash changes on the flash unit itself. This allows us to do it from the camera. When we're dealing with exposure compensation, do we want it to apply to the flash as well as the light that we're shooting in? So where we set that up. We have some wireless flash settings. I do it through the commanding module that I buy just because it's more affordable. And Sony does have some flash units out there, but you will spend a little bit more to get the same equivalent power that you're getting out of that TT685S. Red eye reduction will help fire a pre-flash that will dilate the pupils. We can choose our white balance. When we're using auto white balance, if we come in here, we can actually see there's different flavors more white and a little bit more ambient. Leave it on standard for now, let the camera choose. Most of the time the auto white balance is pretty good. Dynamic range optimizer auto HDR. If we come in here, we have the ability to choose an auto HDR setting, which stands for high dynamic range. Typically the camera takes a few shots and blends them together. It's improved over the years. If you're shooting a sunset and you don't have a tripod or a lot of time, it can save you. Creative styles, again, this is how the recipe cooks the JPEGs. And for example, if we're shooting, let's see here, it should be a portrait. You may expect to see the flesh tones a little bit more accurate in the portrait creative style, for example. In the landscape, you might see better blues and greens. And so these are different recipes that Sony's put into the camera to help the JPEG processing. In the beginning, I almost exclusively tell beginners just to leave it on standard. 
And if you get into more JPEG shooting and you want some help from the camera for colors, then you would experiment with that after you've learned exposure and the focusing and all those things. Picture effect is something I don't really use. You can scroll through them and see some of these effects. Some of them are kind of gimmicky. I don't consider them professional tools, so I never use it. The picture profiles, on the other hand, if you're a videographer, you're going to want to take a look at these. It has picture profiles like S-Log, different gamuts, and this is going to allow us to record video essentially tweaked the way we want. It's not something I put a lot of emphasis on for beginners, but if you're looking to capture a higher degree of dynamic range for video, this is, this is where you would do it. If we want to lock our auto white balance with a sh halfway shutter button depression, we would turn this on. It's interesting how we get these, we have loaded menus and then we come to one that just has one there. <laughs> Focus magnifier, we've talked about, it's that little square we can zoom in on. How long do you want that magnification to last? The initial magnification, do you want this to start off with a box or do you want it to jump in to almost six times? Do you want to be able to auto focus when you are magnified? I have mine turned on to on. Manual focus assist is the jump in. When we're in manual focus, it'll zoom in. We've talked about our peaking setting, which is the color overlay in the focusing lesson. Face registration. If you are at a birthday party and you want the camera to focus only on your child's face, this is where you would come in, you would register your child's face, and essentially the camera would be looking for that face. When and if we have this priority turned on, the self timer, if we take the screen and we flip it forward, we have this turned on, it will give us a little countdown so we can see it. And that is the red shooting menu. There's a lot of information in there. Coming into the purple tab, which is the movie setting, you'll notice that some of these are grayed out. So I'm going to flip the mode dial over to the video recording icon, the film strip. And when I come back in, now we have the ability to choose the exposure mode for the video shooting. And I exclusively use manual exposure because it allows me to dial in the shutter speed and aperture and the camera's not making any changes. And I recommend this even for beginners is to start off with the manual exposure mode for video. The S and Q, which is the slow and quick setting, it wants us to rotate the dial over to that. Same thing, I want manual for both of them. I'm gonna come back to the regular video. File format, I prefer shooting on the top setting, the 4K, the highest resolution. If you have the right memory card, you should be good to go. There's no record limits. So you can record video as long as you can fit that on the memory card. Memory cards are cheap. And there are going to be differences between the data rates that I'll demonstrate if you choose something like this. This is also standard HD, it's not 4K. This is a lower data rate. So for me personally, I'm always on the top setting. When we come into the record setting, we have different options in here, and let me teach you what these numbers mean. The, the number with a P after it refers to the number of frames per second. So when we're talking about 30 frames per second, that's typically what I shoot for YouTube. If you are into filmmaking, 24 frames per second is the standard. And you'll notice that it'll also say Super 35 millimeter, which is about the size of an APS-C sensor. When you see that, essentially what the menu is telling us is that there's going to be no crop. When we're shooting at 30 frames per second, we get a little bit crop on top of our 1.5. It's like a 1.2 additional. You'll see it punch in just a little bit. But this is 4K, and the numbers after the frames per second deal with the data rate. It's the amount of data being written to the memory card per second. So 100M is 100 megabits per second. When I am recording for YouTube, I'm typically at 30P, 100M. In fact, that's typically where the camera is most of the time. There is an exception, and that is when I'm doing slow motion video. In order to get access to slow motion from these menus, we do have to come in and select HD. When I come back down to record setting, here it is, 120 frames per second. It's standard HD, not 4K, at 100 megabits per second. 
And when we play that back in our editing workflow, we would see this as four times slower than 30 frames per second. That's one way we can do it. But most of the time, the vast majority of the time, I am here and I demonstrate some slow motion recording on the crash course. S and Q settings are a little bit different in that we come in and we determine the frame rate in terms of the recording. We can choose 120 frames per second here or one frame per second with everything in between. And then the S and Q mode, it plays it back according to what we have selected here. So if we're gonna export it at 30 frames per second, it'll play the slow motion in slow motion. So that's why it's kind of handy. You know, if you're shooting at one frame per second and you play it back at 30 frames per second, then it's gonna be really, really fast. Proxy recording is something that high-end editors love. It basically means the camera is recording a second set of files, much smaller in resolution, much smaller in file size. So it records the 4K and it records these things called proxy files. The reason why they're amazing is because they're very small in terms of file space and they're very easy on the processor to edit. As the editors are editing the proxy files, they're giving instructions to the computer how to export the full resolution files. The result of this is that they are able to deal with these proxy files far more efficiently or faster without losing any of the resolution when they finally export. For beginners, you don't really need to, to be worried about this. You know, for basic editing, just use the basic files to start until you get the hang of it. For video shooting, autofocus drive speed, when we were doing the touch screen to pull focus, you, we can change how fast that happens, whether it's very fast or slow. We can change the sensitivity if we wanted to, if we wanted to be more responsive. A lot of this is to tweak to taste. Auto slow shutter is something I typically turn off because when I am shooting video, I like to be able to have the manual controls and I don't want it on anyway. The initial focus magnification when you're shooting in video, if you want it to magnify one or four times. Audio recording. Obviously, we do want to record sound. We have a headphone and a microphone jack. But this audio record level setting is pretty important because it allows us to control the gain of the audio signal coming into the camera. So when you see very loud noises and it clips out, you'll see these red markers on the far right. That's bad. It means you're losing audio quality. And if you see that, what you would want to do is come in and turn these levels down. You can see it with this orange line here. And you can see that it's not quite as loud. When you are recording video, keep an eye on your audio levels. You have two channels. There's a left and a right channel. And there's a part of the crash course where I show you how to feed two microphones into the camera. So you can have a microphone on and a host and somebody they're interviewing. And it keeps track of those audio files separately. That's a whole different discussion. Audio level display, definitely recommend leaving it on. Audio out timing should be set to live for now. Wind noise reduction, I've never successfully heard of a good difference it makes, whether it's turned on or off. We have our marker displays. If you want some overlays appearing, so if we turn this on and we come into our marker settings, we could have a guide frame, for example, appear. This won't be on the video, this just helps us line things up. If we don't wanna see that, we can turn that off. Just an easy way to turn the marker settings on and off and then we determine which ones here. Do you want to start and stop movie recording with the shutter button? I kind of like it. Sometimes this button's a little hard to push. You got to get, get your, your thumb at a certain angle. In order to see silent shooting, it wants us to turn back to shooting mode. Completely silent shooting is going to use an electronic shutter. So let's test it out and see if you can hear it. Completely silent. I've used this on movie sets. I was a photographer on a movie set. And while they're recording, they don't want any sound. They don't want the click, click of the camera. Go to electronic shooting, and it almost sounds like you're not doing anything. They're looking at you like, what are you doing? The problem with this is when we use very fast shutter speeds, and this is something that you will definitely see. Let's bump this up. When you're shooting in LEDs, LED lights, which I am right now, which is alternating current, 
is you'll start to see this banding artifact. And this is I actually published a video on this on YouTube explaining why it happens. But LED lights are flickering in, in alternating current. And as they flicker, it's captured differently by an electronic shutter. So this is the limit of using electronic shutter or silent shutter. We turn that off, come back in. Take the picture, play it back. Obviously a huge difference. It's just something to be aware of. Electronic front shutter curtain, if we turn this on, and it, I believe it's on by default, the first curtain is electronic, which means there's not a second shutter. If we turn this off, you should hear two clicks when we take a picture. Very hard to hear on fast shutter speeds, but it's there, there's two clicks. So it is something to be aware of that your camera is set up for electronic shutter curtain first. You're not gonna get the banding that you see with a full electronic shutter. Release without lens or card and enables us to take an actuation without having a lens or a card in. If you are adapting a certain lens over, you know, and there's there's no communication, sometimes this is something you have to do. Pinhole photography, for example, the camera won't take the shot without something connected. So we turn this on, it'll allow us to take the picture. Steady shot, usually recommend leaving it on. There are some times you want to turn it off. In the steady shot settings, allow us to set this up if we go to manual for lenses that are not recognized by the camera body. So let's say you're adapting over a wide angle lens and you, you want the steady shot to balance it out. You can come in here and select the focal length of that lens and the camera will engage its IBIS to help steady it. Pretty powerful. I, the IBIS is pretty good in the Sony cameras. It's improved over time and very impressive, but if it's on auto, it'll do this automatically as you connect Sony lenses to your camera body, things of that nature. I just changed the lenses and I have a 16 to 50 kit lens. It's very common with the A6000 series cameras to demonstrate the zoom setting. When it's set to optical zoom only, we're limited to what the physical zoom of lens is. There's a feature in here called clear image zoom that I wanna demonstrate. This is a 16 to 50 lens. And as I zoom in, you can see the zoom setting changing. And when I get to 50 millimeters, we get this little dotted box and it's going to allow me to zoom in even further, up to two times as much, so 100 millimeters on this lens. So what in the world is going on? Clear image zoom is proprietary technology that Sony owns that they say up the resolution when we zoom past the physical limits of our lens. I don't even know exactly how it works, but if you have a kit lens that is recognized and allows you to do this, it is going to allow you to get in a little bit closer. It's a pretty fun, cool feature if you wanna check it out. Otherwise, optical zoom only. These other two settings depend on the lens that we have. It's only going to recognize the zoom ring root rotate or compatible digital zoom lenses only. So the display button, which is located here on top of our directional pad, we can customize the types of screens that are played back when we are using the monitor, for example, or the viewfinder. If you don't wanna see some of these screens as you're toggling through, you can uncheck them. Same for the viewfinder, as we're looking through here. I like the auto feature. This is this little switch here that will trigger when something's close. When I'm using a gimbal, and the gimbal head is a little bit you know, where we connect it is close to the viewfinder, it'll turn it off. And so sometimes you have to come in and select monitor and that turns this off. If you go viewfinder only, sometimes that can be really confusing because you can't see like right now, I can't see it. There we go. And come back to auto. Frame rate, I like standard, but if you want a high frame rate through the viewfinder, you can turn it to high. The zebra setting deals with overexposure. It's a warning indicator, and we can, when it's turned on, we can control the level. So it's 70% or 80% when we're overexposed. I like to have mine like right at 100. So that means that as I turn up the exposure, we get these zebras marching. Some people like it at 95, a little bit. We can turn different grids on in terms of overlays. If you want to see what those look like. There they are. 
The exposure set guide is when you're changing your exposure settings, when you turn this on, it gives you an overlay that lets you see the exposures a little bit more clearly. This makes it easier to see. I would recommend turning that on. It's kind of nice. By default, live view display is on. And this is going to give us an exposure prediction when we are shooting. So we have an idea about how over or underexposed it's going to be. There are times we are going to want to turn this off, specifically when we are shooting strobes in a studio because the strobes are adding all this light. The camera doesn't really know about that. And it may be dark as well. So when you turn this off, what happens is you lose your preview in terms of exposure, this is going to help the camera focus, things of that nature. So that's the one time I would definitely recommend turning it off is if you're in a studio shooting strobes. Otherwise, most of the time it's on. Auto review means that when you take a picture, do you want it to automatically play back? You can choose two, five, or 10 seconds. Now we start getting into the custom settings. We talked about these first two but we can also customize some keys when we are playing images back, for example, send to smartphone, the FN button by default is set up for that. The function menu we talked about, this is this bottom menu when we press the FN button as we're shooting. And we can determine different features to appear in that menu by changing the function menu set. The My Dial settings is a little confusing. It essentially allows us to customize how our wheels work, whether it's this control dial on the back or the main dial up here. And we essentially come in and we choose a function, whatever it is, white balance, for example. And then we would come back into the custom keys and we would designate a button that would allow us to access those controls. For beginners, I don't recommend this because we have the default settings that are pretty crystal clear. We have our ISO, exposure compensation, drives, display, and we get these indicators here. So I don't recommend changing those when you're first getting started. My recommendation for the sake of simplicity is to keep it set up as the default. And we also have dial and wheel setup where, for example, when we're changing our exposure settings in the manual mode, do you want the directional pad to change the aperture or the shutter speed? or vice versa for the main dial. Preference, it's a preference thing. Which direction do you want them to rotate in terms, in terms of changing the settings up or down? You can reverse those. I like having the exposure compensation set up the way it is. If we turn this on, just rotating one or the other will change it. And that's kind of confusing for beginners. I think it's a, a good way that it's set up, push down and then change it. How does the touch operation work on the back of the camera? I think for focusing, it's amazing, which is why I recommend leaving it there. The movie button, do you want it to always record video? So if you're in a stills mode and you want to record video real quick, you could do that, or you can make it work only in movie mode. We can lock the dial and wheel. So if you're shooting and you got your settings dialed in and you're bumping them and you don't want them to change, you could lock them. The beep, do you want it on or off? Pretty straightforward. And then we get into the green tab. We're gonna be talking about shooting uh, with the app, which is probably the most useful thing in this menu. There's some other things we can do. We have airplane mode, you know, controlled smartphone, things of that nature. I'll be demonstrating that in just a minute. Just wanna kinda of get through the rest of these. And then we have our playback, which is the blue tab. A lot of these are pretty straightforward, protecting images, you can do multiple images all with this date. So if we come in here and we select an image, the idea is this will protect it from being accidentally deleted. If we hit OK, this will not protect it from being formatted. Let's come back out to the menu, cancel. We can rotate our images. We can delete individual images, not something I recommend. Uh, I usually like to see it on a big monitor, unless I know for sure I really screwed it up. The rating, this will give us a star rating. You can see it on the top here. And we can change the rating, pushing to the left and right, from one to five stars or no rating. And when you import those into Lightroom or Photoshop, they should have the star ratings on there. Look at that, it's jumping way back here. That's, that's a glitch. Should be jumping back into this menu. We have the ability to determine 
which of these one through five stars are available when we're rating images. We can use the camera to specify the print order. I typically don't use, in fact, I don't think I've ever used the camera to print images. I usually either download them to the computer first or use the memory card. Page two, this photo capture allows us to export individual frames from video. We have to have a video file to do it. We have the ability to, to zoom in on playback images in terms of how much the, the initial magnification, do you want it as last time or do you want it to standard start? Do you want it on the focused position or in the center? When I zoom in, I'm usually playing back and I'm pressing the zoom button myself and then I'm navigating this way. We have some playback for the interval timer. So we can have continual playback if we want it. It's going to want us to choose an interval timer file, but we don't have that right now. And then we can also choose the speed in terms of how fast that playback is happening. Page three in the blue tab, a lot of this is straightforward. You can have a slideshow, play back your images. If you wanna do that, you can have it loop. At what intervals do you want each image shown? Which view mode we can view by date, folder, format. This is kind of cool because when you, when you get a calendar view, you can see you know, which days you shot and it'll show you all the images on that particular day. On the, let me show you this over here. If we keep scrolling over, we can jump by month. Keep scrolling over, we have access to the different kinds of files. So date, stills, the video formats, pretty cool. Image index is just asking how many thumbnails we want to see when we're using that image playback. So if you come into the view mode and go into the date, so how many images do you want to be able to see here? Display as a group essentially means is that when you shoot a burst of let's say 15 images, do you want them to be displayed as a stack of images or would you just prefer it to view one at a time. So when this is turned on, you can you can view and scroll through burst modes. It's kind of cool. Auto rotation is something that I recommend leaving on. If you turn it off, then it will not always display right depending on how you're holding the camera. Image jump setting allows us to determine whether or not we want to jump through multiple images using the dial, the main dial, or the control wheel. Think of a wheel as a complete circle. And then it's asking, do you want to jump one by one by the ones that are protected, your star rating? There's lots of different ways to jump through those images. And that is the blue tab. Coming into this orange tab, we have our basic camera settings. There's seven pages of it. Some of these are pretty straightforward. Monitor brightness, how bright or dark the monitor is going to be. So if it's sunny, you can see you can turn it way high. Otherwise, you have the ability to come in here and push up or down. Same for viewfinder brightness, wants to adjust in there. We can change the color temperature of our EVF. Gamma display assist is a fancy word for saying, how is this going to look after we have graded it? Probably a more advanced feature for videographers. We have the ability to come in here and look at some of these different gamma displays. Volume setting is obviously how loud the camera is going to be. Delete confirmation means that when we press the garbage can icon, do you want the default setting to be highlighted on the cancel or the delete option? Cancel first is a good idea because it means we have to move the setting if we actually want to delete it. Display quality, standard is good. There is a higher quality. It's going to drain your battery a little bit faster. When do you want the camera to turn off? 30 minutes is far too long. I do this because I'm teaching, but typically two to five minutes is going to be plenty. And then we have an auto power shut off temperature. In the beginning, Sony Alpha cameras were overheating when they first started shooting 4K. We don't see it as much anymore, but if you want to maximize that output, turn it to high and you'll, you won't get interrupted for video recording as much. If you're in Europe and you know what PAL is, you would come in here and change this, otherwise NTSC. The cleaning mode, I demonstrate how to clean your sensor on the crash course. This is something that every camera owner should know how to do simply because there's going to come a time your sensor is going to get dirty. If you don't know how to do it, it can be pretty intimidating because you're, you know, touching the sensor. 
and there are certain tools that make it easier. So if you're interested in that, definitely check it out. The touch operation in terms of the monitor, you can turn it off completely. I don't recommend that. We talked a little bit about the touch panel and the touch pad. This is the touch panel when it's on. When we're looking through the viewfinder, it becomes the touch pad, and this determines which one's active. In all honesty, I prefer touch panel only. Touchpad settings we also talked about in terms of how to change where we're touching as we're looking through the viewfinder. Demo mode is if you're trying to sell the camera as a store, for example. We have the time code settings. A lot of these are pretty advanced. These are for video recorders. So if you're a pure beginner, don't worry about it in the beginning. We have an infrared remote control. If we wanted to start and stop video recording by this remote, for example. HDMI refers to sending a video signal out of the camera through the HDMI port here on the side. The short answer is if you're a pure beginner, pure starting videographer, don't worry about it. High-end videographers are going to use an HDMI recorder to save the video under a different format. And we have the ability to change, for example, the resolution. We can change the frame rate as it's going to the recorder. We can control whether or not information is being displayed. If we don't want to see our exposure settings, we could turn this off, and that's referred to as clean HDMI out. There's a lot of information in here. The time code output, a lot of different settings. Record control, and we can even control recording for the HDMI as well. So just keep in mind there are some really great video tools built into the camera in that's where the HDMI settings are. 4K Output Select wants an HDMI recorder connected to the camera. And when this happens, it's going to allow us to control whether we want simultaneous recording on the recorder and the memory card, one or the other, or certain frame rates. These next few settings here, the USB connection, we have a USB port on the side of our camera. And we can connect different types of USB devices, mass storage, things of that nature. This allows us to select what type of connection we have. The LUN setting, if you're having trouble with it, essentially you can turn it to single, and this will limit the number of compatibility issues. USB power supply deals specifically when you're connected to a computer. Do you want the computer powering the camera as it's connected to the computer? And then we have the PC remote settings, which would allow us to determine that when we take a picture, do we want it saved on the computer as well as the camera or just the computer, PC only. We can also determine whether it's RAW or JPEGs. Pretty useful. And then we have the language setup. If you're watching this video, hopefully you understand English, but there are some other options in there. Date and time setup, pretty straightforward. You saw this when you first got the camera. In terms of setting up the date and time, we can do it again here if we ever need to. The area setting, it's asking where do you live. Copyright information, this allows us to determine some metadata that will be written to the, the files themselves, whether it's the copyright, the photographer, we can display that once it's set up. So you would come in here and type your name out, Michael the Maven, for example and those would be written to the, to the files as we shoot them. Format the memory card, it's going to be a clean wipe, it's going to erase everything, including protected images. I do this every time I put a, a card back into the camera. The workflow that you have, you should try to always have two images. We only have one memory card in the camera, so when you're shooting, as soon as you take that memory card out, back the file up somewhere. I usually make a copy onto a hard drive and then for example, if you have Amazon Prime, you can set another copy on the cloud. A lot of people don't know that. But always try to have two copies, uh, sometimes three if it's important. Because if you lose your hard drive, I can't tell you how many times this has happened to friends. They put all of their images on one hard drive over the period of eight years, and the hard drive dies, and all those memories are lost. So always, always make two copies. When you have your two to three copies and you put the card back into the camera, reformat it, you'll be good to go. The file numbering system, do you want it to continue when you put a new memory card back in or do you want to reset it to 0001? I usually shoot in a series. We can change the three letter designator if we want. Just come in here and change it. 
Page six deals with folder management. We can select the folder that we're recording to. If we have more than one, we can create a new folder if we really wanted to. There it goes, boom. The folder name, do you want it as the letters or would you prefer to have it as the date? Sometimes when we put the card into a computer, put it back into the camera, sometimes the images won't play and we can recover the image database by this feature here. We can display certain media information. Display media info, supposed to show you the amount of space that you can record for your current setting. Should, should work for stills as well. The firmware version tells us about the software that's operating both the camera as well as the lens. Very common to see firmware updates issued by Sony a few months after a camera comes out because of little bugs or little problems. So when they do that, you compare whether or not you have it. And if you need the update, there's a process for updating the firmware. And then we get into resetting the camera completely. So if you wanna reset everything, you can. I am going to leave that off for now, I like the way it's set up. So this last tab here is the gray tab, the My Menu tab. It's going to allow us to choose specific items that we want quick access to. There are so many. 14 pages just in the red tab alone, nine pages in the purple tab, so 23 pages just in those two tabs, plus we get another seven here. You need 30 pages, but you're only going to use maybe four or five of them, and this allows us to get quick, quick access to each of these. So all you do is you choose the item that you want. So let's say file format. We can add it to this location, it's added, Let's say we wanted to add formatting. There it is. Those are two that I use a lot. I'm gonna add it right here. It's adding. So when we come back to the menu, you can see that we have a new page here, two out of two. If we come back to one out of two, here are the two options I just added on video shooting. So, there they are, and I don't have to go searching through the menu just for those two items, and I know those are the ones I use most of the time. We can get several pages onto the My Menu tab. We can sort the items, delete them. We can delete a whole page, we can delete everything. In the end, as you get more experience with your camera, you're going to know which items you want access to, and I would highly recommend just adding them here so you don't have to go searching for them every time. This is a prime example. So I want to add the finder slash monitor so I don't have to go searching for this when I do my gimbal shots, right? Let's come in here, add an item. It's gonna have to go through all of these pages. These should mirror the individual pages for each tab. There it is, add that. And so I've added it to my menu as well. That is an overview, just the surface of the deep menu system on the A6600. I go into more of the philosophy of use on the crash course. Let's talk about connecting with your smartphone to the camera. And I believe the most useful thing that you can do with this is to use it as a remote control to change the settings, take pictures and things of that nature. In the green tab, we have the ability to change our Wi-Fi settings. We also have the airplane mode but the easiest way to do this is to come in to control with smartphone and come to connection. Very important that I point out that the name of the app that you need to download is called Imaging Edge. It used to be called Play Memories and Sony changed it and there was an update just recently in fact. Also, I'm not a huge fan of always staying connected. It's gonna be a battery drain on both your phone in the camera, so I connect manually each time I wanna do this. What's happening is the camera is putting out a Wi-Fi signal that we need to connect with with our camera. So we have this QR code, and when we come into the imaging app, it's asking, do you wanna connect with the camera? Unless you have already registered, it's not going to recognize it, so we're going to hit cancel. I like scanning the QR codes when you do this. I'm gonna say scan the QR code of the camera. You can also go to the near field communication. Let me demonstrate the QR code. 
It's easily going to, going to hook us up. And you're going to notice that as soon as we do this, we get this little cross here. And I'm going to pop this off. Oh. So I'm going to go cancel, come back here, QR code. So with this cross here, I know you can't really see it, but I'm just going to come over here and scan the QR code. It's going to, going to ask, do you want to jo join this network? We're going to hit yes. Basically introduce the camera and the smartphone together. They're communicating. They're becoming friends. Throw this guy back up in here. I believe this is the most useful way to use this app because we can press the shutter button here and take a picture. It will download that image automatically depending on the settings. We can come in and change our shutter speed. We can change our aperture remotely. The distance is about 20 feet or so, and then you run out of, of range. We can set a timer if we wanted to. We can control the burst mode, single frame or multiple frames. We can change our white balance. Very nice. The app has improved over time. It gets better and better. You're going to notice that we have the ability to zoom. Should zoom. By tapping, we're, we're actually remote zooming with compatible lenses. We can change how we are viewing the display. We have a small menu section that gives us some other options, including flash settings, wireless flash, camera information, the review options. We have the ability to embed location or GPS data into our files. We can turn a grid line on, mirror mode. So we have some nice menu settings there. So really, it's a pretty cool way to shoot remotely. We can rotate the frame around if we're viewing it from a different angle. Pretty cool. Now, the things that I don't like about this app is how we have to connect and reconnect when we want to do certain things. So take, for example, right now, we're only in a shooting mode, but if we wanted to see the other menu options in the opening of the app, we would have to disconnect and then re-go back in. So there's no way to, to get out right? There's no extra menu here. Now, when we shoot an image and we want to play it back, we can come in here. We can rate the images. We can see the date and time. We can do a grid display, other information. We get all the information about the image itself. After you disconnect, there's a couple things I want to show you real quick, is that if we come back into the connection, you're going to notice here on the bottom, it says connect with password. You can press the menu button. This is a slightly different way to connect to the camera. It's turning the Wi-Fi on, press the garbage can button to connect with password, and it gives us this password. What we would need to do is to open up our Wi-Fi settings, select the camera, and then it should ask us to enter in the password, and this is the password it wants us to enter. So we need to enter that in, and then it should connect. We can also connect with near field communication. So I'm going to come back into the app. We're not connected, but we have a couple other options in here, including the ability to look at some news from Sony. Link, see, and it kicks us out of this menu. I kind of want to see what's in this menu. It's not a big deal. When you're ready to disconnect, come back into your tab, and select connection, and it should kick you out. There it goes. Disconnected. In a perfect world, once they pair, you should be able to connect, but there are some glitches and bugs. But I, you know, you come back out to this menu and you want to look at perhaps some of the settings. So we can copy the image size, we can go the original size or two megapixels. If I was to give some feedback to Sony, we would like to be able to access this part of the menu. I know they're trying to make it easy to connect to the shooting part of it. And then to make it really easy for it to connect, it's going to look, it's probably going to fail. So there are some bugs and some kinks. If you, if you run into them, you are not alone. But in my opinion, the fastest, easiest way is to use the QR code or the near field communication and then you get access to the remote shooting. I wish it was easier to reconnect instead of needing to rescan or not using a password, but very useful if you ever need remote shooting. And that is how we connect our smartphone to the Sony Alpha 6600. One of the first accessories that you're going to want to get is a set of tripod legs. You can spend a lot of money, like on a Bogan Manfrotto setup, the one that I use, it's about $400.
If you're a beginner and you're on a budget, I would recommend staying away from the Walmart brand tripods. They're very flimsy. They break very quickly. This is not a good investment of money. If you're on a budget, check out one of the tripods that I sell on my website. We have an entry level one, very affordable at the time of this recording, $89. And we're looking for those prices to drop. I've personally inspected them. They're very good. And then when you're ready for a more expensive tripod, upgrade when you have the money. If you do any kind of video recording, you are going to want to invest in an external microphone. In the past, I used to recommend the Rode DSLR microphones. I don't recommend those anymore because they're bigger, they're heavier, and they're far more expensive. Some friends and I have done some research and we've found an outstanding quality microphone that is very affordable. That link is in the description as well. It is the Maven Mini Mic. Great value if you are just getting started. I'm also happy to announce a new program that if you get the crash course within two weeks, if you let us know, we will give you a coupon code that will allow you to save 20% off the tripod, the microphone, camera straps, filters, anything we sell on the store. When we're talking about lenses, there are some very important pieces of information I need to share with you. There is some confusion on the Sony E mount lenses. See, we hear this E mount, but the E mount can mean APS C sized sensors like the A6600, or it can also mean full frame lenses that we see on the higher end A7 series. FE is full frame E mount. In plain E should be APS C, but you have to go in and you read the fine print whether this is designed for full frame or APS-C, it's a very important distinction because there's a lot of lenses that are out there that are designed specifically for APS-C and full frame lenses that will work on your APS-C camera. The reason why I say that is the full frame lenses can be expensive, but there's also this benefit of being able to swap back and forth. So if you know you're going to get a full frame Sony camera in the future, it kind of makes sense if you know you're just gonna stick with your camera, then you should stick with the APS-C lenses. I also have to make you aware of the crop factor on your lens. It is 1.5. What does that mean when I say that? Basically, because we're shooting with a smaller sensor, there is going to be a magnification on your focal length, your field of view, and your depth of field. So if you're shooting with a 100 millimeter lens, it is going to behave as a 150 millimeter lens. It's a very important thing to remember when you're planning the lenses for your camera. If you are a pure beginner, the 16 to 50 kit lens is a good place to start. It's not a bad lens. It's very compact. I have saved mine simply because there are times I want to go very light. I don't want a heavy lens. I, I still use it to this day. If you're looking for something a little bit more telephoto, you're probably looking at the 55 to 210 as an entry level kit lens. It's, it's a good place to get started and prices on lenses from there go up. The high end Sony lenses are the G Masters and these are lenses designed to work on the full frame cameras. There's the 16 to 35 2.8, the 24 to 70 2.8, the 70 to 200 2.8. There's a 100 to 400 sport shooting lens, it's amazing. Those four lenses right there are gonna cost you 10 grand. There are tons of other great lenses. Sony just announced a 16 to 55 2.8. It's expensive, but it is designed for APS-C and it's smaller size. It's more affordable than some of these higher end G Masters. The Tamron 28 to 75 is very popular. Keep that in mind. Build your lens collection according to what you shoot. But in the beginning, stick with those kit lenses, the 16 to 50, the 55 to 210 until you are ready for something more. At some point, you are going to want to get a flash system. And the flash that I've been recommending for Sony shooters is the Godox TT-685S. It's about $110, $120. You can also get it with an off-camera transmitter. This is the exact flash that I demonstrate and teach on the crash course. So I know flash can be very intimidating. There's about a 40 to 50 minute crash course lesson on it, and it will demonstrate how to get started with the flash, how to do off-camera flash. It is a very powerful tool to put into your arsenal. If you enjoyed this free tutorial and you want to take your education further about the Sony a6600, I've always said this, the best investment that you can make is between your two ears. Check out the Sony a6600 crash course. I will teach you the basics and then show you how to shoot like a pro in no time. It comes with a 100% money back guarantee. 
In any event, hope to see you guys on the Facebook group. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.